as, as that was going on, at a certain point, someone approached me about, um, uh, about working on a, a, a book. And so it became, my, sort of my, it became natural that my first book was going to be about blood feeding creatures since out of the 1,450 or so different bats that, that exist in the world today, three of them are vampire bats. And, um, and people who haven't seen me for 20, 25 years and they see me on social media, they contact me and they're like, well, well what do you do for a living? And I'm like, well, I study vampire bats. They're like, well, that makes sense. It sounds like you. Um, and this is, I was always the, I was the kid who had the monkey when I was young and, and, and boa constrictors and lizards and all sorts of strange stuff. So, so it was no real surprise to a lot of people that I went into, in, into the study of bats. Um, but my first book was about blood feeding creatures and I also sort of, um, found that I could go back and, um, and sort of look at, um, at, at confusing topics uh, and turn them into something that was interesting. I, as, a, as a professor, I like to entertain when I'm up uh, in front of people, uh, especially when it was students. And they were all, you know, in the old days, we were looking at your watch. Now you're, now you're on your phone. Um, so I try to keep it light and try to keep it entertaining and, and there and, and once I can grab the audience then, then, then get some facts in there and get some things in uh, that I want to get across. So, so it was a sort of a no-brainer that, that my first book was about blood feeding creatures and then after that I was, uh, you know, my agent asked, so what are you going to do next? And I thought, well, I seem to have found this niche where I take weird topics and and, and, and look at them from a zoological perspective. And so I picked cannibalism. And that turned out to be, you know, I've been calling th that book the, uh, the gift that keeps on giving. And a lot of my friends have told me about, you know, they're on the subway and, and they're reading this book and all of a sudden the people that were sitting next to them are moving out of the way and giving them all sorts of room. So, uh, so it, is, it is sort of a service in that regard. Um, so, uh, so I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's next after cannibalism? And, and I said, all right, well, maybe I'll do torture. And my wife was, and son were like, no, no, we're not going to be living with you for three years dealing with torture. And, and, and so my agent uh, and, and my editor at, at Algonquin both suggested that I try something a little bit more mainstream. So they, they said, well, why don't you do the heart? And I said, well, that, it's been done a million times, and it's got to been, have been done so well that how am I going to be able to find the kinds of weird stories that I like to tell? But once I started to do the research, I realized that once again that there, there was this sort of niche, uh, and and so that's what I uh, that uh, th some of the things that that you'll you'll see today, most of them are in this book, and 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 uh, once again I try to to keep it entertaining, um, but also uh, make it s educational as well. Okay, so so you guys are going to laugh at this one. So uh, all right, so what are hearts? This is gonna, there's going to be a quiz later, and. It, it, Hopefully you guys are going to do okay. Uh, so hearts and circulatory system, short answer, muscular pump that moves a fluid. Most of the times that's blood. It, when you're dealing with, with the animal kingdom, that's not necessarily the case. Around the body through a system of tubes. What's their function? To supply the body with oxygen and, and nutrients uh, and to carry away carbon dioxide and, and, and waste products. Uh, now, there's a note here, an asterisk that, that you know, not, not all creatures out there, um, it's especially insects, oxygen and carbon dioxide are not carried uh, by the circulatory system. As you're going to see, they've got this thing called the tracheal system, which, is, which, which answers the question why there could not be a giant, you know, why there couldn't be Mothra, which is a, uh, you know, a question that all of us ask at one point in our lives. Okay, um, so do all organisms have uh, a heart and circulatory system? Uh, absolutely not. All right, so who doesn't have them? The, the tiny, tiny is the, is the word here. Uh, so small, the flat, the folded. Uh, in the animal kingdom, you're dealing with things like sponges, anemones, corals, starfish. Uh, when the, the easiest to see would be sort of single-celled proteases if you're trying to see this in action. And, and, and so the question becomes, why don't they need a heart? Why don't, why don't they need a circulatory system? And, and the answer is that these are creatures that generally exist in high oxygen environments um, where the, the, there's a greater concentration of oxygen outside this little tiny organism than there is inside. And by the same token, the carbon dioxide that's being produced is a byproduct of, of, uh, of, of things like cellular respiration. Um, it, it's highly concentrated inside the organism. Now, what takes place here is that 
Um, and, okay, so you have a low concentration of carbon dioxide in the environment, a high concentration of oxygen, and you have the opposite when you're dealing with uh, uh, the inside of, uh, of, the, of the creature. So via diffusion, which all of you are familiar with, the oxygen moves from a high concentration outside the organism through tiny pores in the cell um, um, into the organism, and by the same following its concentration gradient. And by the same token, the carbon dioxide, which builds up to higher levels inside the organism, diffuses out to a place where there's less carbon dioxide. So the, the way that I, I, I sort of, the way that I explain this when I'm talking to high school kids or college kids is I, I, I sort of compare it to my, my bedroom closet. And, and my bedroom closet, if you, if you open up the door, all of this stuff sort of comes, pours out onto the floor. But if you have the closet closed, right, just envision that I've got m my bedroom closet is full of junk, and now I carve, cut little holes in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the door, and, and theoretically, uh, small items that are packed inside in a high concentration are going to be able to come out through, the, um, uh, through those holes that I cut in the door, uh, but some stuff, larger things, won't. Um, so that is, you know, that's really how I explain uh, diffusion to some people. Um, all right, so the, the story here is that diffusion works if you're small, but diffusion does not work if you are a thick organism made up of thousands and thousands of, of, of layers of cells. Uh, it, it just doesn't work. It, it's sort of, it, it, sometimes it works very, very slowly, but it's not efficient enough, for example, to supply oxygen uh, deep into, oops, deep into this uh, uh, organism. So that is why, um, in order to grow larger, uh, the circulatory systems and hearts had to evolve. You had to find a way to get, uh, uh, you, to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, and nutrients uh, and w with the environment. Uh, and that's why we have um, circulatory systems. So instead of diffusion now, we're talking about, uh, uh, about ve tiny veins, capillaries, et, et, et cetera, uh, where this diffusion actually takes place on a microscopic scale. All right, so that's the stuff that you already knew. Okay, so when we're talking about, uh, in, in nature, there are basically two types of card-carrying circulatory systems, and, and one of them you, you guys are very familiar with, uh, and, and that is, so, and by circulatory systems, I mean hearts or heart-like pumps carrying blood or, in, in, you know, for uh, insects, it would be something like uh, 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 hemolymph. Um, two types. One are closed circulatory systems, which everybody is here is certainly familiar with. And, and the key here is that the blood that is, or in some instances, hemolymph, that is moving through the system never leaves the system. So it always stays with e either within the heart or the vessels, no matter how small those vessels are. Um, an open circulatory system is quite different. Um, and, well, let me back up a sec. Uh, in these closed circula circulatory systems, you can often build up great pressure as the heart contracts and sends its blood uh, on the way to the top of the neck of a giraffe. Uh, an open circulatory system, which many, many, many thousands of different species of organisms have is quite different. And you can also think of this as, a, as more of a low pressure system because the blood or hemolymph that is pumped out by this structure, sometimes it's a heart, sometimes it's not, um, eventually winds up going into, it's, it's going to supply tissue, right? It's going to supply cells. But instead of going into capillaries and, and ha having that's where that exchange takes place, it gets dumped into a chamber called the hemocele. And surrounding that hemocele are, are cells and tissues, and that's where the exchange takes place. So there's a major a, a difference here. Um, so in closed system, the blood is staying within, um, within the circulatory system, and here you can see an insect where here you've got this contractile vessel here, and the hemolymph is dumped out moves into, a, the, the hemolymph is dumped out, moves into a hemocele, and then sort of seeps its way back into this contractile vessel, and the whole thing happens again. All right, so how is a heart stimulated to, 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 to pump blood? Of course, you are all familiar with myogenic hearts, where you're dealing with the fact that there are pacemakers that are modified muscle cells, um, and, and the electrical 
current that is produced here as it moves through the heart. In the wake of that, uh, that causes this, the muscles, the myocardium, to be stimulated uh, and contract. So, of course, you're all familiar with this stuff. What we'll be talking about in a bit is a very different type of heart, and that is called a neurogenic heart. All right, now this is the, this is the, the, the probably the, uh, the most simple, uh, the most simple slide that you guys have seen during this conference. And of course you know all of this stuff, but, but I want you to concentrate on here, uh, in this region here, because this is where the problem um, throughout history was, and that is in the pulmonary circulation. Of course we're talking about the right side of the heart, pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs, uh, and then picking up oxygen, getting rid of carbon dioxide, and then returning to the left side of the heart uh, where it is pumped out to supply the body. This is what was misunderstood for so very long, and we'll talk about that in a bit. All right, so um, how else does, uh, uh, what, what, what else helps blood circulate? One of the themes in my book was the fact that organs seldom work by themselves. And, you know, I always used to tell my students when I taught anatomy that you can't really, you know, you, know, and you can't really teach about the circulatory system this week, and then you sort of take an exam and forget it, and then you start talking, talking about the respiratory system the next week. It just doesn't work like that, that there is this interplay between systems, and there are organs that are helping out other organs. That's not something that necessarily comes across really well when you're looking at college, even college textbooks. So always make a point of, of, of letting my students know the, the, this type of thing. Uh, as I said, a lot of times you have assists going on here, and, and most of us, uh, of course, uh, we know that um, the heart gets an assist from certain blood vessels, large vessels, like, uh, like the aorta, for, for example, um, that are also contractile. Um, and so you can envision, uh, this is, uh, of course, simplified, uh, you can envision myocytes surrounding a vessel, and when they contract, it would be the equivalent of you squeezing a water balloon and sending that blood on its way. And this is why we have problems when you get things like hardening of the arteries, and these vessels are no longer contractile, that leads to problems. Okay, so let's talk about the animal kingdom for a bit, and we're going to start out with, um, w with invertebrates. Uh, but if you look at the lower right, you'll see uh, an earthworm, and, and these are creatures that don't really have true hearts. What they have in this instance is, is five paired contractile vessels, which are called aortic arches. And, and everyone knows what peristalsis is. Basically, there are peristaltic waves that are produced as these aortic arches contract and send this hemolymph, in this case, although I use hemolymph and blood uh, sort of interchangeably, uh, around the body. This is an organism, like insects, where the, circulator, where, where the respiratory system is not intimately tied to the circulatory system. An, earth, an earthworm, for example, gets its oxygen and, exchanges, and gets rid of carbon dioxide through its skin, cutaneous respiration. And, and this is really one of the key reasons, you know, cutaneous respiration, any kind of movement like diffusion takes place best when you have wet surfaces. Um, and here, no doubt, same thing takes place where you have, and this is why earthworms are wet, um, and they are exchanged, the oxygen is coming from the environment, passing through their wet skin into their bodies, uh, and by the same token, the carbon dioxide that builds up is leaving but via the same route. The, the, um, the circulatory system really doesn't get involved in that so much. And that's kind of the same thing that's going on um, with, with insects. And they also have these contractile vessels. You know, you guys probably wouldn't call them hearts, but there are four or five different pumping structures that are found throughout the bodies of insects. For example, to pump hemolymph to the antenna or to pump hemolymph to the, to the wings or to the legs, places that are sort of distant uh, from, this, um, from this contractile vessel here. But, but I want you to look here, and th this is, so here's the reason why you'll never see a, a, an actual mothra, uh, you know, this gigantic creature. Uh, and that's because they respire right through, directly with their environment, through holes in the sides of their bodies called spiracles, 
which ramify into smaller, first now a trachea and then tracheoles, this sounds familiar, I know. Um, but the, the oxygen is delivered directly to the cells uh, and the carbon dioxide moves out in the same way. Now this is really efficient when you're small, but it's not efficient if you're trying to envision Mothra. So the question that I sometimes get from, from zoology types is, then why do I see these, um, uh, the, these pictures of, of gigantic dragonflies back in the, you know, in the Pennsylvanian period, uh, you know, millions and millions of years ago? And the answer from what scientists have been able to piece together um, is that, the, that there was a higher concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere back in those prehistoric times. And so this allowed these insects with their tracheal respiratory systems to, to grow larger. Not so much anymore because oxygen levels are, are not the same as they used to be. Now this is, um, uh, this is one, one of my favorite creatures. I almost wound up studying these guys instead of bats. Um, and those are the, uh, the cephalopods, the, 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 the octopus and, and, and squid and, and, and cuttlefish. And they are invertebrates, they don't have a backbone, but, and they have three hearts. They have a closed circulatory system, so I don't want you to think just because it's an invertebrate, it, doesn't have a, it has to have an open circulatory system, not the case. They have two branchial hearts, so here comes this deoxygenated blood back from the body, right? And it enters into these two branchial hearts, which you can see here, and that, when, it, when these muscles contract, sends that deoxygenated blood to the gills, picks up oxygen. Now a systemic heart, which is located here, contracts and sends that oxygenated blood out to the body. So it's a very unique system that we think evolved because they're, they're, these are high energy organisms, uh, they're, they're especially squid. They move around, they're predators, uh, and, and this is a system that evolved to deal with the fact uh, that they do not have a vertebrate uh, circulatory system, uh, but they have these needs for not only size, um, uh, but also um, a, a lot of activity. Okay, so uh, getting into the, uh, into the vertebrates now, um, we're going to start with the, the system that is the, the heart and circulatory system that is most close, I would say, to, uh, to the invertebrate systems, and, and that would be the, the, the fish heart. Fish don't have a pulmonary and systemic circulatory system, you know, these two separate circulatory systems that we're all so, uh, so familiar with. The blood moves in a, uh, in a, in a single loop. And here, so, so here comes deoxygenated blood coming back from the, from the body. And it enters into something that is kind of like a, you can think of this as sort of like a, uh, an accessory atrium. So it's a, a, this is a place where blood gathers before it moves into the single atrium proper, uh, then into the pumping uh, um, chamber, the ventricle, which gets a huge assist from this muscular structure, which you can see here, um, which moves, which basically is a, a is a stretch and recoil type of situation, to very much like um, l like uh, large arteries in in, in humans uh, to help to assist the heart uh, sending it on its way, in this case to the gills. When you're dealing with reptiles, most reptiles and amphibians, they have a three-chambered heart. And the thing here is that, that there is some mixing. So you can see here the interventricular septum is incomplete. So there's mixing of, uh, of venous and, uh, and arterial blood. Now the knee-jerk reaction to that in the past has been something along the lines that this is inefficient. This is this is a, you know this is a failure. This is why do, you know ours is better. Uh, well, ours is more complex and it certainly leads to more problems. But you but one thing that I, that I try to get across to my audiences and my readers is that just because a system like this is different than the, you know is different than than the system found in humans does not at all mean that it's inefficient it has evolved over millions of years and works perfectly fine for these organisms just like the five aortic arches work perfectly fine if you happen to be an earthworm so so that's what, that that that's another take home message here you know, when I was a kid, it was, uh, you know, Neanderthals. And it was, you always saw Neanderthals, and they were sort of like dragging a, a female around by the hair, and they were hunched over, and they all had a club. 
<laughs> we now know that they had a brain that was larger than, the, than modern human brains. Uh, and so we've got to get away from this idea that just because it's not human, uh, that doesn't mean, you know, you know that, that doesn't mean that it's somehow defective or, uh, or should be looked down upon. That, that's something we should all get away from as, as scientist types or perfusionists. Not that they're different. Okay, so I, I was looking for an interesting story to, to open the book with, and, and, and I got lucky, but nine blue whales in, uh, in, in Newfoundland got, got very unlucky. And so I, I wound up telling the story uh, that, that concerned a bunch of my friends at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And, and, and the, what, what happened there was, uh, to, in, in brief, uh, is that a curator in mammalogy, a friend of mine, uh, received a phone call that nine blue whales had, uh, had, had died on the ice in Newfoundland. They got caught in, um, in, a, in, a, in an area um, and, and wound up um, on top of the ice, uh, they, they wound up dying. And this was tragic because this was kind of a large percentage of, the, it was about 4% of the, of the blue whales in that region. And the thing is that, um, that, that my friends specialized in whales, but, and they were trying to, uh, to, to know as much, of course, as they could about all of the whales in that, 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 that frequented the waters of, of Canada. And they'd gotten over the years questions like, what's the largest heart in the world? And the response would be, blue whale heart. And they'd go, how big? And they'd go, uh, uh, size of a car, uh, SUV. But they really didn't know. And so you had all of this stuff going in the literature about, oh yeah, the, you know, the aorta of a blue whale, you could swim down it, that sort of thing. And so the reason for this is that blue whales, when you kill them, when they die, sink. Right? So that's why they were never the right whales. Right whales were the whales that when you, in the old days, if you threw a harpoon in them, they didn't sink. And blue whales were fast, and they sank when they died, so very little was known about their anatomy. Now the story here is that three of these whales didn't sink. We believe that they were propped up on the ice and they started to drift. And they, when they eventually, um, one of them got trashed in a, 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 in a storm. Um, another one got, uh, came, uh, came ashore at a place that was inaccessible to the researchers. But one of them came ashore at a small town uh, in, in Newfoundland, Trout River. Um, and to make a long story, a short story even longer, my friends decided that they would go up and try to recover the heart of this whale. And this was a massive undertaking. So uh, we're talking about construction gear uh, and, uh, and a team of about a dozen people. Uh, and so they got up there, and, and, and first of all, if I back up a sec, the, the, the oh, no. The townsfolk were, were frightened because they had seen the videos of whales exploding. And, and so there'd be, these vi <laughs> there'd be these videos on YouTube of, of like a sperm whale being carted through a city in China and all of a sudden the thing detonates. And I, I, <laughs> I had the picture on the outside of my office door at, uh, at, at, at LIU and the title was Bad Parking Spot because <laughs> There were, there were all cars all over and people got sprayed. So, they, so the folks at Trout River were freaking out that this was going to happen. So my friends were like, that, that knew about this said, you know, we don't, unless people get up and start jumping up and down on top of uh, this thing, we, don't, we, we think they're going to sort of deflate like a balloon and, that, and, and that's kind of what happened. But there was this initial fear that there was going to be this gigantic explosion. And, and this, guy, this guy just happened to come ashore right next to the only restaurant in town. So, so, so there was a little bit of paranoia there. Okay, so they got in and they got dirty. And so these guys, so, so basically when, when they opened up the side of this, they, they, you know, they used heavy equipment and they pulled the ribs apart and, and four of them went inside to see if they could push the heart out through the ribs, which they eventually did. And you can see, um, you, you can see the results here. But when I looked at this and when they looked at it, I, I said, it, it doesn't look like a heart in these pictures. To me, it looked like a 400-pound soup dumpling. And, and so 
they decided to clean it up. Um, they had to transport it, which they did in a flatbed truck, um, and they rinsed it. They eventually preserved it, or fixed it, rather. You know, a lot of us, are, when we were in, in high school and college, were worried about getting formaldehyde splashed on us. You know, oh, God. Uh, well, these guys... So these guys were dealing with thousands of gallons of formaldehyde. Uh, and, and so you can see this, this uh, so the fixation process took months. Ah, no, pushing the wrong button, rated PG. Um, and and he, the fixation process took months. Here, here it is being carted there uh, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this net. Uh, and then they, they fixed it. And you can see they had to plug up the vessels. And, and so they used an assortment of bottles from a five-gallon uh, drum uh, to small, uh, to pop bottles for some of the small uh, vessels because they had to fill this thing uh, with, with, with formalin uh, in order to keep it from uh, uh, rotting from the inside out. So they didn't want to just stick this thing into a giant jar, so they sent it to Germany to be plastinated. So they sent it to the plastinarium. Um, which is run by a uh, by a German fellow who is um, who is a bit strange. He's already arranged for himself. He's got a unfortunately he's got a uh, he's got a a, 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 um, a fatal disease and he's already arranged it that that he's going to be plastinated. He told his wife that you know she can she can have him for like a week or so whatever it, it is. To sh uh, but but after that he's going to be plastinated uh, and he's going to greet visitors at the plastinarium with his top hat, which is his uh, sort of uh, the thing that he does. So you've all seen plastinated bodies in places, you know, the, the, the live bodies exhibit where you've got like a guy playing basketball but he doesn't have any skin, that. It, uh, it, yeah, so this is the same type of thing. And uh, so, the, so they had done small, the smaller jobs before, but they'd never, done a, uh, uh, they'd never done a blue whale heart. And so there it is in all of its glory. They put it on display at the ROM, but the thing was that by the time I got there, the display was gone. They had it stored in a warehouse, and they pulled the thing out. Um, one of the things that, 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 that I found interesting about it is, well, they took it out of storage, and there I am next to it, uh, was, was the shape. You know, it was, it was very much not the shape of a, of, of a typical heart where you've got the, you know, the, where it sort of comes down here, like the apex. Um, it was it was bilobed and it was uh, very strange looking, and and some of the vessels that they found they still have no idea what they are. Now they're all excited because they got another uh, they they got another baleen whale uh, that they were able to recover the heart, different species. And now you know as anatomists love to do, they're they're now able to compare these structures uh, between two different species. So that's sort of ongoing right now. Let me see if there's anything else I forgot about these guys. All right, yeah. So one of the big surprises that they, that they found, and there were many, well, well, first of all, one of them was that if you took a heart and laid it here right there, it would make a mess and I'd get in trouble. But if, if I took a heart and put it on a tray, it would sit there, it would have form, it would be solid. This thing collapsed. You know, like I said, it reminded me of a soup dumpling. And we think that that has to do with the great depths that these animals um, uh, take when, when, they, when they dive uh, to thousands of feet. We don't know for sure, but, but that's the hypothesis. The other thing that really stood out was that the heart was a lot smaller than they thought it would be. So as you can see here, there are no vessels that you could swim down, unless maybe you were an otter or something like that. And so the, this, the, the heart weighed in at about after, they, after fixation, about roughly 400 pounds. But they were expecting something a lot, a lot bigger. Now, why, why is that? Because in the animal kingdom, there are creatures that have much larger hearts. For example, hummingbirds. Hummingbirds have a heart that's eight times larger relative to its body size than a blue whale. So if you had a 90 ton, you've got to envision this, a 90 ton hummingbird, right? Do the math. It would have a, a 3,200 pound uh, heart. So much, much larger. Uh, and, and the question is that they asked was why? Why is the hummingbird, and shrews are the same, those little mousy guys that aren't really rodents. Why are their hearts so large? Uh, and for the hummingbird, and I'll use that for an example, 
they beat their wings at 80 times per second, 80 times per second. And of course, to do that, they're using their wing muscles. And those wing muscles need oxygen, and they produce carbon dioxide. They need nutrients. They're producing waste products. Um, and so in order to, to, to deal with that demand, um, a hummingbird heart beats at around 1,260 beats per minute, 1,260. So d do the math. That's crazy. I mean, the, the, it, has to, it, it has to pump, fill, pumping. We think that this is about the limit that, uh, that mechanically uh, that, that, a, that, that a heart, that this structure can, can pump. Um, so, the only other, so, so the only other way to get more blood to the, to the muscles is to have a larger heart. So every time the heart beats, more blood is sent out to the, uh, to the wing muscles. So that's the story of why, um, uh, why, uh, why the blue whale heart is a lot smaller than, than, than we thought it would be. Blue whale's heart beats um, you know, ten, maybe 10 times per minute. When they dive, we think they may, they may beat two or three times per minute. So the, so the demand is not there. Ah, okay. Um, going back to my theme of organs seldom work alone. Uh, when I was a, a when I was a graduate student, one of my favorite papers was was by was by um, Dennis Bramble and Mark Carrier, um, and what th and and th basically what they showed, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, is that um, when 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 horses gallop, all right, you know, so you've got w when you're breathing, you're your thoracic cavity is increasing in volume and decreasing in volume as your uh, diaphragm is moving back and forth, right? And that changes the pressure inside the thoracic cavity, and so your lungs either fill or, 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 or empty. Well, what these guys found was that the liver of horses is attached to the diaphragm, as it is in most of us, but here's, uh, hopefully all of us, um, here really securely. And as a horse is galloping, as the horse strides forward, the liver pushes up against the diaphragm and helps, and, and literally is an assist to help the um, to, to, to help expel air. And then, as as the horse is not striding forward, as you see here, the liver moves backwards, and as it does, it pulls on the diaphragm, increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. So I was always into this, and when I wrote this book. I looked for, I, I wanted to find a system where there was an assist to the heart. And what I sort of wandered into by, by accident um, was a horseshoe crab. And, and, and that story turned out to be, in my book, the, well, the least, uh, probably the least important and, and, and the, my least favorite thing about this whole story was that, uh, was, was that the movement of the, of the gills back and forth, and you can see them here as they move forward and back, they were an assist. This is an open, open circulatory system. Uh, they were an assist um, to move blood into and out of the heart. All right, so that was, that was, nah, that was interesting, but, but not incredibly interesting. Then I started to, to, to think back about myogenic hearts and the difference in the animal kingdom of hearts that were not myogenic, that were not, uh, that, that were not stimulated by pacemakers. And what we know now is that in many animals, they have a neurogenic heart in which there, are, there is a ganglion uh, that sends Im nerve impulses to the, mus uh, to the cardiac muscle, and in response to that, the heart will contract. So that was the story here in, uh, in, in the horseshoe crab. And uh, once again, I started out, I was like, okay, well, I can start, I, 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 wrote, this, I wrote this whole section about, uh, about Aztecs, you know, because you're always seeing them yanking out the heart at the top of the, you know, they're up at the top of, the, of a pyramid and they're holding it out to their people down below. And I thought, this is why you never see Aztecs like with a, a, a lobster heart. Or a or, or horseshoe crab heart because as soon as they pulled that thing out and held it out to the crowd, it would it would stop beating. So, it, so, so so that's the sort of snarky way that I went into this. But then it got way more interesting. Okay, so horseshoe crabs have been around for a long, long time, and the, and the term living fossil gets thrown around a lot, a lot. Uh, but these are creatures that 
you know, 450 million years ago, it looked like a horseshoe crab. So they are true, true living fossils. Uh, and they have, they have survived all sorts of, uh, of mass extinction events on this planet. But they are in real trouble right now. Now, if you go back into the late 19th, early 20th century, the, the problem was, and you can see these are walls that are made up of horseshoe crabs, is that they were initially used as fertilizer. Um, and after that, um, fishermen that were eel fishermen, so they used traps and whelk fishermen, were chopping these things up and using them uh, for bait. So this put a big crimp in populations, but in the 1950s, starting in the 1950s, and then the research sort of took off in the 60s and, and really took off after that, um, researchers found out that a substance in their blood um, called limulus amoebocyte lysate was incredibly important, important and saved probably now thousands of, uh, of human lives. And I'm sure you guys have run into the, these uh, tests, these assays, um, when you're dealing with sterile equipment. And, and, and it was discovered that there's a substance in their blood that is now used in an assay to detect um, endotoxin. And I know that this is not exactly, you know, this is not the exact definition of endo, of, um, uh, of, um, of endotoxin, because there are, some, th there are some differences here. But one of the reasons that you guys have to use these tests when you're dealing with a sterile situation um, is because bacteria like E. coli, when you sterilize uh, equipment, you're destroying that bacteria. So the bacteria aren't releasing endotoxin because they're trying to fight off uh, you know, enemies. They're releasing it in, in many instances, it's part of these lipopolysaccharides are part of their cell membrane. And when you sterilize and burst that cell, you release this substance. And if this substance happens to get on equipment, a catheter, um, a medication, uh, and get into a patient, it can cause real problems. Um, so you're dealing with things like endotoxic shock, um, and, and so it is a life-threatening situation. So what these researchers found out was that when, when this substance found in, in horseshoe crab blood comes into contact with endotoxin, it has a reaction, it clots. It forms a, a, a visible clot. So this was used, um, on a, and what turned into a, an industrial scale uh, operation. And this replaced the sort of uh, rabbit tests that you used to hear about. You see these pictures of, of testing on, on live rabbits that, you know, I won't even get into it. Um, but, but people were pretty well excited that they could do this and, and, and get away from that nasty rabbit uh, test. But the problem is, is that you usually don't see horseshoe crabs. You see them in the spring when they come to sh on, on shore to mate. And this is when they're collected. So they're collected before they mate um, and before they're able to, to um, in a sense, lay all their eggs. The males come in, they have a big party, everybody goes home happy. Um, but the problem is, is that, that, that many of these, most of these crabs are collected. Um, and by law, you have to return them to approximately where they're collected. But this is sort of a joke because where, where I live, I live on the east end of, of Long Island, and, and for years I wondered why you'd, I'd see pickup trucks in the spring, and, they'd be, and the back of the pickup truck was loaded with horseshoe crabs. And I'm going, where are they going? Why, why aren't they in water? And these are probably being transported to these facilities now where they are hung up, and you can see them here, upside down. And here's a cannula being inserted into, uh, into the horseshoe crab, uh, and then they literally bleed them until they stop bleeding. So first of all, they're carried to these places in an unrefrigerated uh, truck, backs of trucks, no water. Uh, and then they're hung up uh, and bled. 30, 40% of their blood is removed. Uh, now, if you back up, I'm gonna back up a slide here in theory. Look at the heart here. And here's that fold that you see, and this is where they're putting the cannula in. Right above that heart is this ganglion that is involved in, uh, this cardiac ganglion is involved in making, 
stimulating the heart and causing it to contract. If you stick that cannula into that ganglion, you kill the horseshoe crab. So, I tried to get into some of these facilities that, you know, you know because I do realize that there's a, there, there's a good here, you know, but it wasn't working. They wouldn't let me in. Um, but, but horseshoe crabs are now in danger. And there are, there, lately, something like 10 years ago, um, recombinant DNA technology has, has led to an assay to detect endotoxin that does not use horseshoe crab blood. And large drug companies, a couple of them started using it until COVID hit. And then there was this sort of like, um, you know, a, they, this was abandoned because it was only a few companies that were producing it at the time. And everybody went back to the tried and true. Um, so this is why horseshoe crabs are now in, uh, in serious, serious trouble. There's four species of horseshoe crabs. Three of them are endangered because in, in Asia they eat them. Um, won't go there. Um, but the ones here, we don't eat these, but they're, they, it is problematic. So there, there is a hope that once, you know, once hope, hopefully COVID is gone, that we, we can go back to these assays that, that, uh, that, that don't require horseshoe crab blood. All right. One of the questions that I, uh, that, that I wanted to answer was, was where did this whole idea that, that, that the heart was the seat of, of intelligence and, and intellect and, and the soul, where did that come from? Right. Um, when I, when I wrote a book about cannibalism, and I and I was going to write a chapter about you know why cannibalism is this huge taboo, I was going to name the the chapter "Blame It on the Greeks," and and my editor talked me out of it. And so when I was going to when I was writing this book, and I wanted to come up you know, explore the idea of where this this concept of of, uh, of cardiocentrism came from. Uh, I was going to name it, blame it on the, the ancient Egyptians, uh, but I didn't. In any event, we think that's where this came from. You know, the ancient Egyptians really thought much about the heart. They preserved it separately. They thought that in the afterlife, here you can see in its own separate urn, it was weighed against the feather of Mat, uh, and that's the god of truth and, and virtue. And basically, you're, it's a determination of where you're going to be in the afterlife. Uh, th so it was extremely important. They saw it was centrally located. It moved. It you know was it, it was vital. It responded to stimuli. They didn't think very much of the brain. In fact, during the mummification process, they would pull it out your nose with a hook uh, and then discard it. So so cardiocentrism started with the um, uh, with, with the ancient Egyptians. Now their medicine, their science was extremely uh, w was. Uh, was um, extremely important and held in high esteem by the Greeks and Romans who followed them. Uh, there was a, a lot of exchange between the, the, the cultures, um, especially the ancient Greeks. Uh, by the time it got to the Romans, while the Egyptians and the Greeks thought that the heart was important, um, they really had no clue about how it worked. For example, they thought that, that there was arterial blood on the left side and that there was air on the right side. Uh, so, so there was this, there, there were all sorts of problems that, that existed. Now you're looking at several thousand years ago, so that's real, or a, a thousand or so years ago, not such a big deal. Um, until Galen came along. Galen was a Roman surgeon who lived from 129 to 216 CE, and, and he was extremely influ influential probably wrote about three million words that were recovered, three million. Um, and so he was uh, limited by the fact that he couldn't do human dissections. His big, this is where this came from. He believed that some blood got to the right side here through invisible pores in the interventricular septum, uh, where it would mix with this sort of magic animal, uh, magic air, substance called pneuma, um, and that would be uh, carried by the arteries. He also was uh, carried on with this concept that was, came from the ancient Greeks of the four humors, where a in a sense, anything that, that was wrong with you could be dealt with by balancing the four humors, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood. And, and some of them were probably alarmed because they couldn't find black bile because it didn't exist. 
But this stayed around for a long, long time. And you're like, well, why? The reason is, is because after Galen, after the fall of Rome, um, Galen's work, which was a uh, tremendous amount of it, was not translated initially into Latin. And when it was translated in the Middle Ages, it was translated by Syrian Christians. And they put their Christian take on this work. Um, so when it was eventually translated into Latin with this sort of Christian slant, the church loved it. And they proclaimed Galen's work to be divinely inspired. So for the next 1,500 years in Western medicine, you couldn't do anything except follow the word of Galen. So things stagnated big time. One of the things that, um, I'm gonna go through this quick because I'm probably, I don't know how much time I have here. Um, but one of the things that, that lasted for way too long was this concept of, of, of bleeding uh, and, and with, with leeches. Um, so they would attach medicinal leeches to you to sort of balance one of these humors, and that humor, uh, in this case, wa uh, was blood. Uh, the, George Washington, they bled George Washington about 40% of the blood in his body uh, the day that he died for a throat infection. So when did Galen get the boot? Well, uh, in the West, it was the 17th century from William Harvey and others, and in, in, in China and, and India, it, it happened uh, a lot earlier. A couple of things here, that, uh, the, the, um, so some, of the, uh, some of the innovations that took place after Galen got the U out, uh, the stethoscope, which was developed by uh, Dr. René Lenaik, uh in Paris um, to treat patients who, well, not necessarily to treat, but to detect consumption, which we now know as tuberculosis. And they would use two methods to figure out if you had this, uh, uh, this buildup of fluid. One was percussion, and this came from, from people who worked in, um, in, 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 in places where wine was stored, and they would tap on the cask to figure out how much liquid was in there. Uh, and the other was to sort of listen, uh, but, but listen to, to, to the chest. But back then, um, you know, people had uh, uh, ectoparasites, they didn't bathe as often, you didn't really want to put your head close to, uh, you know, a woman's uh, chest. So, so, uh, so Lenaik came up with this idea after, supposedly after watching some kids, um, one of them scratching the end of a stick and the other with his ear against that stick. Uh, th this, all of these stories are in the book, and, and this one on, on Warner Forsman is, uh, to me, the, uh, if, you know, I write fiction as well, and I could not have written a, uh, something that was stranger than this first cardiac catheterization, um, which was performed in, in, in 1929. He, this was a, a, a young, a, a young um, physician working in a hospital, his first job, and, and he had seen, he had, he had seen, um, a procedure whereby a catheter was put down the, uh, the, the, uh, the jugular vein of a horse and, and sent down into the, into the right side of the heart in order to measure pressure. And he thought, well, instead of, he was trying to get around the, uh, use, puncturing the heart to, to, you know, to add you know, whatever kind of um, medicine that you wanted to add to the heart because you, you, know, you could cause all sorts of bleeding, you could damage the heart, and he was looking for a way around that. And what he came up with was, he did this to himself. He took a urinary catheter, he conned this nurse into, uh, into, into um, opening the cabinet so he could get at these catheters, which was locked. Um, then he, she agreed to, to be the patient. He ties her down on the table, and then he leaves. And, and when he comes back, he's got this thing up, threaded up his antecubital vein, and then talks her into going to the fluoroscopy room so that they could take this picture. He gets fired. Years later, he's in World War II. He's captured by the Americans. He, uh, event, they, he get, he, because he was joined the Nazi party in the early 1930s, he couldn't practice surgery. Uh, but years later, then, he's, then he becomes a lumberjack, which I guess I cost what you do when you can't practice surgery. Um, and years later, he wins the Nobel Prize. OK. Um, yeah, so so talk the, so just when you thought that it was okay to like hang out, and we weren't going to have to hear about leeches anymore. In the 1970s, leeches made a recurrence because of uh, the, um, surgeons who went who were in in, in Southeast Asia in, in places like Vietnam, came back with um, w with information about 
about leeches being used in reattachment surgeries, and that's why you see John Wayne Bobbitt here. I've cut out a couple of slides that I thought might not go over that well. Um, yeah. So, so three of these leeches are actually used in reattachment. And here's the story here, and, um, and I'm sorry, I'm sort of running over. But, um, but when you, if you're doing a reattachment, let's say someone got their ear sliced off, you put it, you, you reattach it. The, the, the arteries, which are thicker walled, are easier, to, um, are, are easier to knit back together. But the veins, which are thin walled, not so much. So the blood can get to the reattached organ but then it pools there because the, the veins are either, either fail or you can't reattach them. So the blood accumulates, you have problems, uh, the, the reattached organ um, can fail. So what they discovered, and I think this was in Southeast Asia from what I, everything that I learned, was that if you put leeches around the wounds after the reattachment, they will act as a sort of circulatory system. So here comes the, uh, the oxygenated blood, enters the, the reattached the reattached organ, right? And then the leeches draw it off. So then new blood comes in. So now that gives the body time to repair. Uh, meanwhile, the, the anticoagulants in the leech saliva are keeping clots from forming. So we're using this now uh, as, a, um, uh, as a technique. Leeches USA was the place that I've, I wandered into this place. It was about, out of, out of oh, it, it was literally 10 minutes from my school and I had no clue. <laughs> All right, yeah, so. Interesting, Th this book, and you'll have to e either talk to me later or, uh, or, or, or read the book. This was the chance that I got, having worked on vampire bats for my entire life, or, or for the last 35 years or so, not my entire life. I mean, I always got this question, it was like, yeah, you've been studying vampire bats for so long, well, how's that gonna help my grandmother survive? And you know, when I wrote this book, I made sure that the animals that I picked were animals that had clinical relevance. Um, one of them, not so clinical, um, was the Antarctic ice fish. To make a long story extremely short, uh, these guys have a, a, an antifreeze in, uh, in their blood that, that, that literally lowers the temperature that the blood would normally freeze. So what happened? A, uh, an ice cream manufacturer in Europe decided to use this antifreeze in their ice cream. Why? So this is not quite clinical. Um, why? Because if you've ever had ice cream and you've opened it up and you're eating it and then you decide you're gonna put it back in the refrigerator and, and then when you eat it again, it's like all crunchy and it's a bad mouthfeel type thing. That's because larger crystals have formed. What this guy has, what, what these guys have done is by using this antifreeze, this, this or antifreeze latches on to these smaller ice crystals in the ice cream, doesn't allow it to grow. So that's what, <laughs> that's what we're using uh, antifreeze from uh, ice fish. Takotsubo syndrome, how many people have heard of it? Oh, really? Takotsubo syndrome, after I've written a whole book about how there's no connection between hearts and minds, or, or, or not the way we used to think about it. In 1990, Japanese researchers came across 30 patients. They were all women, most of them were, were, were postmenopausal, that came in showing, um, uh, th th that looked like they were having heart failure. So when they did the workup on them, they discovered that that was not the case. There were not, for example, uh, clogged coronary arteries. When they did the uh, uh, radi radiography, what they found was that the, the, um, the, the, the left ventricle had a strange shape to it. And that shape reminded these guys of these lobster, uh, lobster pots, of these octopus pots that fishermen use, that, that uh, octopus fishermen use, called taco subo. And when, so this became known as Takatsubo syndrome. In the West, it became known as broken heart syndrome because what was going on here, what these patients shared was the fact that recently they had had traumatic experiences in their lives. Um, for example, they'd lost their husbands, they'd lost their jobs, they'd attempted suicide. And what they now hypothesize is that what, to, and, 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 and like I said, there's no damage to the coronary vessels. That was, that was huge. What they believe happened is that, that this was a sympathetic response. When, when, when we get scared or, or get traumatized or, or, or frightened, uh, yeah, um, which is different than scared, um, you release stress hormones. And these stress hormones are not gonna be around for very long. After the stressful situation goes away, um, then, 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 then 
there's no more release. What we believe is happening here is that, that this is sort of an uncontrolled release of stress hormones. And one of the things that can happen there is vasospasm. So the, rather than these cardiac vessels being clogged, we think that they might have been spasming, which gave the indication that, um, that these women were having heart attacks, when in actuality, it had to do with the fact that it was an, it was a, um, an abnormal release of stress hormones. The good news is that after three to six months, this seems to go away. Uh, but there is this connection between, uh, between the, um, the heart and, and the mind. Okay. What do you think? One minute? Okay. Well, zebrafish. We're not able to cut 20% of our heart off and have it repair itself like zebrafish do, so we're studying why that is so. Why can myocytes go into a reproductive phase? That's not possible in humans. Um, the Burmese python, huge problem in, in Florida. Uh, this is a horrible invasive species that got here because of, um, of pet owners releasing their snakes in a place where they had um, no, uh, no, no, no predators. A researcher um, by the name of, of Leslie Leanwand figured out that when a python, a Burmese python, eats a large meal, which is what all constrictors do, they can sometimes maybe eat once a year, but when they do, their heart grows four times. Um, excuse me, grows 40%, not four times. 40% after a meal. And this is not sort of like um, pathological heart size increase that, that you might be familiar with. This is healthy heart growth so without exercise. And so the idea here is that if, if people who have had heart problems, that you can't put them, and you can't put them onto, a, onto a, an exercise uh, regimen, that you might be able to figure out what this is, and they think it's three different amino acids uh, that you might be able to use um, to cause healthy growth of the heart. All right, I'm getting the hook. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, just, just, just to touch on this, you can read about the fact that some people are trying to deal with the fact that, um, that there was a major, major problem with not enough organs to transplant by growing your own hearts. And in some instances, that problem that I talked to you about, uh, this is the last slide, about, uh, about small vessels, um, other researchers uh, like, like Glenn Gaudet of uh, Worcester Polytech are using, I'm sorry it wasn't cabbage, because it sounds like you guys use a lot of cabbages, but, but, um, but he used spinach. They drain all, they drain all of, the, um, uh, of the, the cellular material out of that, uh, and they leave, the, they, they leave the cellulose, and they build vessels on these spinach veins that they are now going to try to implant into humans. All right. There you can see the veins. So conclusions, yes, you've heard it. Uh, all sorts of structures have evolved to, 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 uh, to supply oxygen and nutrients. The ancient Egyptians, I think, are the first to, to, uh, to come up with uh, cardiocentrism. Uh, Galen it was a good guy, but uh, the, the church who decided that, that his word was divinely inspired, not so good. Uh, and medical advances, uh, our past, present, and future, uh, continue to transform cardiac medicine. Uh, thank you, guys. Thanks. I, I just want to skip and thank um, um, uh, Luke, Luke Pui and, and, uh, and Susan, who made this happen. Uh, this is my artist, Patricia Wynn. And if you are interested in anything else that I might have done, or uh, I'm writing a book about teeth right now, but the natural, the natural history of teeth. It's very weird. Um, here's that information. Oh, I did a TED-Ed on uh, transfusions, too, if you guys might want to check that out. Um, and I'd ha be happy to answer questions, but not now, probably. <laughs>